hello everybody. So uh, my name is Ming Shi Wang. The topic I'm going to present uh, today is uh, how we distribute Uber's machine learning use cases with an operator framework. My agenda. So firstly, I will talk about the motivations, why we want to build a common generic workflow framework uh, across the whole company to solve very uh, flexible and complex use cases machine learning. And then I will talk about uh, in technical details uh, what is the operator framework and how we design it and what it can solve. And then I will come to two use cases. Uh, first one is the hyperparent search. Uh, second one is uh, patch model uh, training. And finally, I'll talk about how we serve patch model. And I will uh, close my talk with some of future work uh, we are going to do. If you look at the right uh, graph, uh, this is really, really simple uh, use case of machine learning pipeline. So you can see here, we are just training a single model. First step is that we get the training data set from a Hadoop data lake. And at Uber, so usually we store uh, old users' data uh, on Hadoop cluster. And next step is that we run some kind of uh, ETL jobs and data cleaning jobs to uh, transform the raw data to some uh, clean, uh, uh, transform the feature data called feature transform. And after that, we will send the feature data to uh, the model fi uh, fitting jobs where uh, the uh, interesting work model training happens. And the output of model fitting is that we got a model and a bunch of evaluation results. So that's why we uh, cut evaluation of the models. Based on the model types, uh, we got the evaluation matrix. For example, uh, for classification uh, models, we got the AOC figure. For regression models, we got the uh, MSE, et cetera. And next step is the deployment of the model. So once we verify, okay, the model is good, uh, has good performance, uh, it's valid for use in the production environment, and we want to deploy the model to production environment. And at Uber, so there are lots of uh, different environments for deployment. So a model can be deployed for offline uh, batch prediction purposes, or can be deployed to some online prediction service, or even be deployed to a mobile device. For example, uh, the self-driving cars their models are hosted in, in their mobile devices. And next is serving. So serving uh, most happens on, so at Uber, so majority of, uh, almost more than 90% of the serving jobs are uh, online serving. And uh, a minority of them are batch predictions. And there are many challenges uh, in solving uh, very different or complex use cases at Uber. So for example, uh, the data set, right? So, we, can, we need to support uh, processing of 100 gigabytes of data or even terabytes because uh, data usually crosses hundreds of cities. And we have very complex workflow as well. So this graph uh, represents the most simple ones. But at Uber, so uh, people or users usually train very large ensemble models and uh, their training pipeline can uh, span very different computing environments or even uh, clusters. For example, for deep learning jobs, the data prep stage can happen in one cluster uh, where uh, data is located in the Hadoop data lake. And then the training process can happen in a different uh, cluster where we have the right uh, resource scheduling tools. And those are, uh, can be different, different uh, data centers than the Hadoop data lake cluster. And after the data training, so we get back the model to even other data centers uh, for uh, model management and storage. We need to uh, have our good model management infrastructure. So to give you some idea, every week uh, there are about uh, 1,500 models trained. This is really a huge number of models. And we need to have a well-designed storage layer to persist the model and also the model artifacts so that users can uh, keep a history of all their trained models evolve the models based on the uh, performance and then deploy the model with one click process. And finally, so our online prediction service has been challenged as well. So to give you some uh, sense of uh, uh, the QPS, so from Uber East or dispatch along, uh, the highest QPS is 650,000. It's really large. And usually we uh, deploy and some very large ensemble models to prediction services. So the ensemble model can be large that it doesn't fit uh, in the memory of single host. So we have to design very well uh, state for services 
let's split the ensemble models into sub hosts uh, within the service and have a routing layer that routes the request to the appropriate subgroup of hosts for serving purposes. Finally, uh, we find that it's, re it's really, really important to monitor the health of the whole system, both from an engineering perspective and also from an end user perspective. We need to be alerted whenever something's wrong with the whole machine learning platform. And also we need to provide a well-designed dashboard such that users can know uh, how their models perform. So for example, we usually keep a subset of the prediction results. And later on, when the outcome becomes available, we will compare the difference. We will know uh, uh, how the prediction result deviated from the, the, the true outcome. Uh, if a deviation is beyond a threshold, we know that the model is out of date uh, and user has to uh, evolve the model again. Okay. And with this, uh, so many uh, complex and flexible use cases, how do we provide a generic uh, framework to our users? It's easy to use. And uh, the users have to uh, be able to focus on the machine learning uh, pro problem uh, itself without worrying about uh, the engineering details or the environment setups. So our solution is that we devised uh, something called uh, operator framework. Uh, so this graph shows the, uh, is the uh, representation of the operator framework for the previous uh, simplified machine learning pipelines. You can see here, uh, this is a very simple workflow that composes of many of the uh, uh, operations. So each operation are represented by an oval uh, can be thought of as an atomic function that consumes an input, some kind of inputs, and then do calculations and produces some kind of outputs. And operators are connected by each other by uh, a link called channel. So a channel uh, basically stores the uh, data the, or payload data, uh, which is the output from an upstream operator, and then sends it to uh, the input uh, of the downstream operator. So uh, tied up together, so these operations uh, form a direct cyclic graph. So you can see that uh, also, yeah, so each operator has a bunch of uh, hyperparameters that specify uh, in what uh, environment it should be executed. It has uh, some parameters that controls the runtime behaviors. And this is the logical concept of workflow. So this is all we present to the end user. Okay, so here's the case, uh, how we uh, describe a hyperparameter search using this operator uh, concept. You can see here, this is a simple uh, grid search paradigm. So we have a uh, start operator uh, followed by feature assembly. Uh, DSL re represents the, uh, the main specific language uh, which transforms the uh, raw feature data to some canonical form of data. And then we have a parallel uh, running uh, training uh, plus evaluation drafts. And uh, we have uh, best model selections operations, which uh, waits until all the uh, parallel training finishes and then uh, finds out which model is the best based on the uh, hyperparameter co configurations. And then we finish the whole process. So this is really a simple, a logical description of how we uh, perform the hyperparameter search. And then how we, how we execute, uh, how we transform this logical operation to some execu uh, execution plan. So uh, inside Uber, we have a Piper, which is a data management infrastructure that's, that we use as the coordinator. So uh, essentially what we do is that once we got this logical description of workflows, we have a compiling layer that translates uh, this logical workflow into some uh, execution plan. So the process is like this. We lead the diagram into subgraphs. So each block uh, indicates a sub deck. You can see uh, each, uh, each squared block contains uh, one or more operators. So these operators will be executed in the same process. So in other words, a block or a task is the smallest unit of physical execution and uh, the execution of all the tasks are coordinated by Piper, which is our data uh, management info. Right, so I forgot to mention. So uh, the way that uh, we uh, fuse of one or more operators inside the same physical task is that uh, the operators can be executed in the same environment or, and uh, they can be executed in the same uh, parallelism unit. So, uh, and also we uh, consider how to optimize the performance so can we do better? The answer is yes. 
we do a checkpointing uh, at the level operator. So that means that each operator can output some checkpoint uh, data uh, to a persistent storage layer. For example, uh, the domain specific length transformations, we can save training data. Uh, the train operators can save the model file uh, to external and uh, also the training data with prediction result to uh, external and evaluation can uh, save the evil report somewhere uh, persistently so that uh, if a single uh, operator fails during the whole process we can fail fast and then retry later and during the retry time so uh, the workflow engine will uh, will see uh, whether uh, a checkpoint has been written so that it knows whether uh, the operator has been successfully run uh, for this stage before and then skip it. And uh, this graph uh, illustrates our uh, system design for the operator framework. Uh, it's going to be very technical. So uh, if you look at the left side of the graph, uh, there are a few layers. Uh, first layer is the front, uh, front end layer where uh, we have the UI or the program interface exposed to our end users. So like the user can, uh, uh, can schedule uh, a predefined uh, machine, train, uh, machine learning workflow, or they can customize their own ones uh, by writing some code. And then we have the Michelangelo API layer, uh, which uh, connects to the front end. And, and the uh, logical workflow of the user committed can be uh, sent to the Michelangelo API layer. And by the way, so uh, the API layer is really the brain of the whole, uh, of the whole machine learning platform. So in a sense that uh, it maintains a story system, uh, it maintains the whole state of the machine learning pipelines, and also it uh, stores the uh, running status of uh, uh, training jobs. And next, we have the workflow orchestrator. So uh, once the uh, logical workflow is sent to the API layers, the API layer will just call the workflow orchestrator. This is where uh, we do the compiling. So we compile uh, the logical workflows and translate it to physical execution plans. So the physical execution plan, as I explained before, is um, a set of uh, execution uh, tasks. So each task is just a few uh, set of operators. And then each task, and so sorry, yeah, so the workflow architecture will uh, persist the logical workflow as well as the physical workflow to, uh, to the database. And right-hand side uh, shows our uh, uh, runtime layer. So it consists of a, a pipeline generator. Uh, this is a long-running task. So that periodically posts uh, the API layer for a snapshot of all the active workflows. And then the generator uh, sends the uh, snapshot of, of all the active workflow to the Piper framework. So the framework will uh, inter uh, maintain its internal state such that it knows uh, what which workflow has been running, which workflow has been pending, and compare with the active ones to see uh, how, how to schedule tasks. And then Piper framework will, uh, based on that, will schedule uh, a series of physical uh, tasks to be executed and send it to the Piper task queue. Uh, this graph shows how we execute a task. Suppose a task has been uh, scheduled for execution. Then we have the task execution unit. So a task execution unit is really nothing than uh, just command line, uh, plus uh, some of the environment variables. And it calls a uh, job service, which is a reverse proxy uh, that talks to many of the resource schedulers for clusters. So it could talk to uh, Mesos, could talk to Yarn, uh, could talk to uh, Kubernetes uh, for scheduling dog rice jobs or Spark jobs. And uh, it sends the, uh, inf the basic information in, in some task to, uh, to the job, uh, either dockerized job or Spark job. And then this job will uh, have the callback location uh, that knows how to call the, uh, Michelangelo, the, the machine learning API layer to get more co uh, contact information for tasks. For example, uh, what operators are inside this task and what are the runtime parameters. And then it knows how to execute uh, this subset of uh, operators inside the physical task. And the, uh, of course, yeah, so uh, all the jobs talk, uh, have access to the storage, the storage layer for uh, persisting checkpoint data. So this graph shows how we uh, maintain or store the uh, runtime status for, uh, for the whole pipelines. And if you look at the, right, uh, the left-hand side, so we have uh, the API layer has the storage 
uh, storage that uh, stores the uh, status in the three levels. So top level is the workflow level status. That shows whether the workflow is, uh, is either, either uh, scheduled or uh, running or failed. And then uh, at the next level is the task level status. So it shows uh, whether a task has been scheduled, has been running or queued, right? So underneath it, so we also store the operator status. Uh, that's for uh, debugging purposes. And then uh, these, uh, this status can be populated to the UI for, for the end users, such that they have knowledge uh, on the overall execution status of workflow. And also, and also the Piper framework will pull the API layer to get the uh, workflow uh, status such that, uh, and also task status, such that it knows whether a task has been completed. And then you can decide to, okay, I, I can DQ a complete task and schedule next task for execution. Uh, let me go to two specific use cases, uh, how we use the operator framework to solve some interesting problems. The first one is hyperparameter search. So uh, let me explain what is hyperparameter. So hyperparameter is some kind of a parameter of machine learning uh, workflow that's not uh, learned from uh, training data. Uh, a few examples is the learning rate or the regularization factor. So these are the factors you have to specify beforehand. And um, uh, this is, uh, okay, so sometimes it, it requires the user to have some uh, uh, prior knowledge of machine learnings and so that they can know what are best, they can make at least have a guess what was the best value to use. But for majority of users, they uh, have no idea uh, what would be the, uh, the best uh, hyperparameter uh, values. So we have to solve the problem for the users uh, with three uh, strategies. Uh, first, we allow the user to do grid search. So what does grid search mean? So that means we try all possible combinations of hyperparameters. And for each combination, we do a model training and evaluations. And at the end, we aggregate the uh, evaluation results to find uh, which combination of hyperparameters results in the best model. This is called grid search, but it's really, uh, it's really naive and it has many drawbacks. For example, the number of evaluations uh, will increase exponentially with uh, each addition of parameters. So this is not doable when we have too many hyperparameters to search for. And the better approach is random search, where we just uh, select a subset of the uh, hyperparameter combinations uh, randomly. And then uh, for, each one, for each combinations, we do uh, model training evaluations. And interestingly, so um, people usually find that a random search uh, gives a comparable or even better result compared with the gray search. So can we do better? So that's called Bayesian optimization uh, hyperparameter search. So essentially, this is an adaptive hyperparameter search approach that uh, uh, will allow the users to uh, try some combinations of hyperparameters and do training evaluations. And then based on a history of the uh, past evaluation results and the hyperparameters used, it will guess the best unknown hyperparameter combinations that most likely will give a better eval result. So I won't go into details about the Bayesian optimization, but if you're interested, you can learn from uh, many online uh, materials. So how do we uh, solve, allow the users to uh, specify uh, how they want to uh, perform hyperparameter search with a Bayesian optimization? So the whole process is like iteration, right? So uh, this graph shows that. So initially we, um, we got uh, some hyperparameters, uh, mostly from just random uh, hyperparameter combinations. And then we train the model, got some evaluation results. And then we, we call the uh, Bayesian optimization libraries to get the next suggested values. And then we uh, train a model again and do evaluations. And then we uh, look at the evaluation results, see uh, whether it has improved or not, and what are the history, and whether we should uh, keep the process uh, with more iterations. So when, when should the iterations, iterations start? So we allow the users to specify, okay, I'm only willing to uh, try 10 iterations. So if after 10 iterations, the EVAR result doesn't improve too much. Uh, it most likely means that my model is not correct. Or uh, my model is already good enough that cannot be improved further. Or if the target metric has been met, we can stop early. Okay, next is the, I want to talk about the partial model training, which has been used uh, very, very widely at Uber. 
So before I talk uh, about what, what a patch model is, think about this problem, right? So in Uber, so the data set uh, usually spans multiple cities. Uh, usually they are spanning uh, more than 350 cities. And within each city, there are many sub areas. So what's interesting is that uh, if you look at the data, you will see the distribution differs really, really uh, differently across cities. So that really means that if you train a global model, just using the, the whole data set, uh, it's really hard to get uh, very good performance. So for example, if uh, the distribution of uh, the data is in San Francisco differs quite a lot from Seattle. However, you train the model uh, by using data from the two cities. So you can see that the performance uh, will not be very satisfying. So how do we solve the problem, right? So we uh, partition data. Uh, first by city. So that means uh, we, for each city IDs, we uh, partition data such that each subset of data contains only data for, for that city. And then we train a model per uh, sub data set. So I, I'll call that a city model. And then we can do further uh, splitting, right? So we split the uh, uh, city uh, data by uh, vehicle view ID, which is the sub areas of city. And then we get even smaller data. And then we train a model for each uh, for uh, the further split sub data set. Could there be anything wrong or can we do any better? So as you can see that uh, it's not always true that uh, a model for a subset data uh, will outperform its parent model. It's also likely that uh, for a subset data set, right, there's not enough uh, records uh, for all labels. And in these cases, uh, we will just uh, prune the model uh, as bad model and let them fall back to its parent. So what fallbacks means is it's during the prediction time. Uh, instead of the, using the model for this uh, sub data set, uh, we use, we use uh, this parent model. So this is what fallback happens. Right? Yeah. And uh, it's also easy to uh, describe the partial model training pipeline uh, with the operator framework. So uh, if you look at this graph, uh, so everything is the same except the training uh, areas, uh, training phase, right? So uh, after we generate, we partition the data set and generate the partition plan, we know how many partitions of data we need to train. Uh, for each one, we need to train a submodel, right? And then uh, generation uh, plan will know, uh, will launch a subset of the uh, uh, training jobs where each job is responsible for training a subset of the models. And then we have an assembly of child models. So here, uh, the channels between uh, training, uh, the training job and the assemble uh, child model uh, job uh, has the synchronization phase such that the assemble model, uh, child model operator will wait until all the parallel training has completed such that they can gather all the uh, train, uh, child models to uh, make them an assembled uh, partial model tree. How do we serve a partial model, right? So uh, it's also simple. Uh, look at the same example. So suppose we have test record. So what we do is that we look at the oppression columns of the data set. In this case, we look at the city ID and uh, the vehicle view ID, which is a sub area of the city. And if you look at the example, uh, if a city ID says it's one, we just uh, check if there's a, a subset of a model such that uh, it's trained for a data set of where city ID equals one. And then we look at the vehicle view ID, uh, which is two. And then we find uh, the corresponding child model. And here we stop because we found a, a serving a child model. So what could be the problem, right? So uh, at Uber, so we face the challenge that uh, we have, we usually train model for 350 plus cities and for altogether 3000 vehicle view IDs. That means uh, we, we can train an ensemble model that contains more than 3000 uh, child models. And to give you some, uh, some figures, so each model, for example, if it's a, G G a GDB tree model, uh, usually occupies uh, 75 megabytes in memory. And if you multiply this number by 3000, uh, you will see the total in ensemble model will occupy 200 plus gigabytes. It doesn't fit in a single uh, host memory. So, so how do we solve the problem, right? We, we, we partition the model into uh, sub-model groups until each model, a sub-model group can fit in a single uh, machine's uh, memory. And then, and then uh, we uh, partition the prediction service into subgroups of hosts. 
each uh, subgroup host is responsible for loading uh, a certain model group at the bootstrap time. And we have a routing layer uh, that based on the uh, partition column of the uh, request data, uh, it knows how uh, which subgroup host uh, should, uh, should serve this request. Okay. So this is how partition model serving works. And there are definitely some of the uh, work in progress and uh, we want to do in the future. So for example, uh, we need to align the operator framework uh, with Spark execution optimizations. Uh, this is because uh, at Uber, so a majority of the machine learning training still happens inside Spark. And we want to optimize uh, the Spark uh, performance. Next is that we want to provide uh, a well-defined program interface, very similar to carriers, such that users can write uh, very easily their customized workflows in Python. Yeah. And then we want to uh, make the uh, uh, operator framework generic enough such that people can uh, write their own customized operators and workflows in um, any programming language. And we want to uh, support a checkpointing for XGBoost. So XGBoost is also widely used a learner and we want to checkpoint this uh, in for operator uh, retry purposes. And then we, we want to contribute back to the community. And we also want to integrate with Uber's uh, natural language processing pipelines and deep learning infrastructures. And finally, it's really, really on our roadmap to open source the whole project. Uh, so thank you.